Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Before I introduce my guest, I just want to remind you guys about my Patreon. If you go and join patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered, not only will you be able to watch interviews such as this one live streamed, you will also be able to submit questions for my guests, get access to my fine art photography and video and so much more. So go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered, and I promise you will not regret it. There's so much content that I put up there on a weekly basis. Okay, so let's uh, introduce our guest. Um, She's one of the most popular porn stars of the last decade. Um, She's somebody that I've been trying to get on the show for a while, so I'm super thrilled to have her here. We have some amazing questions to go through. She's been through quite an emotional journey to get to where she is today, and so I'm so excited to bring you the one and only Kimmy Granger. Hi. Hi. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for finally having me. Oh my god. Finally have thank you for being so patient, obviously. Well, I mean, I to be fair, I dropped the ball for like yeah. almost a year. I was like, hey, you want to come on the show? You're like, sure, great. And then I like vanished no, for a year. Fine. So I'm very sorry about that. <laughs> but funny. here we are today. Yes, happy I'm to be here. also super excited because you said this is your first podcast. It is. I'm a little like, you know. I'm like excited. I'm nervous. I'm going to pop your podcast cherry. You are going to pop my podcast cherry. It's oh one of the last cherries that I actually have left <laughs> in my body. <laughs> so what, why have you never done a podcast before? Have you been asked to do it and you turned it down or? You know, I have been asked to do podcasts. It's just, I think it's just divine timing. Every time the, it's when it's my time to go do the podcast, I, something comes up or Mm -hmm. I can't make it or whatever. So maybe this is just, okay. Yeah. I I was hoping that you were going to say, well, you didn't want to do any of those other podcasts because yours is the best. Yeah. They weren't up to your level. (laughs) And you were like, if I can't do Holly Randall and filter, then I'm never doing a podcast. It was the main goal, but the whole time. Okay. We'll just go with timing. (laughs) Divine timing. Thanks, Kimmy. Um, <laughs> the universe knows that your podcast is the best, and that's why yours is my first. There you go. Okay. Special. Good save. Yes. Good save. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So usually I start from the beginning with my guests. Yeah. How did you get into the adult industry? I got – oh, my God. Okay. So I got into the – I was – a stripper. I started off as an exotic dancer, stripper, whatever you want to call it. I call those strippers. because It's, you know. Um, and I was about 19 years old. I stripped for about maybe six months. And, you know, I had a crush on this guy that I worked at a restaurant with. And my first job was a waitress. And I was in love with this bartender. Like I was crazy about him and he was not even cute. He was kind of creepy looking, but I was obsessed with him and he dated a porn star. And so I felt like I needed to like get on that level. So I became a stripper. And then I stripped for six months, got completely over him. I ended up hooking up with him. It was like a whatever thing. And I was like, you know what? Fuck this. I'm going to go be a porn star. And then I like looked into like nude modeling I looked into like other things. I answered an ad and it was for a company that shoots adult films in San Diego. And I answered it and they wanted to do like a one-time thing. Like you can only shoot for us once and then you can't work for anybody else. You have to sign a contract, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, whatever. Like, I don't think I'm going to do porn anyway. Mm -hmm. So I committed to it, but I, I bailed so many times. I think I bailed on him like four or five times. And then he was like, you know what? I don't have any more work for you. Um, not for like the next couple of months. Cause I was, I was nervous. I was like, I don't know, like, this is scary. Yeah. So he's like, whenever you want to take this seriously, hit me up. But for the meantime, if you actually like want to get into like real porn, I have a friend who's an agent in the industry. Um, here's his number. If you ever want to pursue that. And I was like, okay, whatever. Like I saved the number. It's actually really nice that, cause initially he wanted to sign you to a contract where you would only appear right. at, for him. Mm-hmm. And then when you flaked on him a bunch of times, he was like, here's somebody else's number who can help you get into all of the yeah. other productions that I was trying to keep you from doing with this contract. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was meant to be, that's the way I look at it. It was definitely meant to be because it worked out mm-hmm. like to my favor. I ended up getting, I think I had like a bad night at the club. I was like, fuck this shit. Like I'm going to go do porn now. Fuck mm-hmm. this. I like mm-hmm. did all my research. How much do porn stars make? Like how much could I make? And you know, what do I need to do? Do I need to get my tits done? Blah, blah, blah. Like I like did all my research and I ended up calling the agent 
um, I won't say his name, but oh, yeah. he was, you know, he was amazing. He was my first agent. I have so much love for him. Um, and he flew me out to Miami, got me like a week's worth of work. And it was just, it was love at first sight. I was obsessed. Like mm. I had fun with, or I enjoyed the the life. I, I was 19. So I'm like, this is like so new and exciting and wrong and like dirty, but fun. And like, I don't, I didn't know what to make of it, but I, it just felt right within me. Mm-hmm. And so I just kept going and it just continued to flourish. And I'm like, okay, this is exactly where I need to be. This, I had to be triggered and emotionally affected by some dirty bartender who dated a porn star for me to get exactly where I need to be in life. I truly feel that. Like, I think it was like a karmic destiny or something. (laughs) Isn't it so interesting how the universe works in like such mysterious ways? It's so crazy. Yeah. I, I look back on it and I'm like, holy shit. Like if I wasn't so like boy crazy- this probably would have never happened. Yeah. It would have been like a lawyer. Yeah. I don't know. Oh, God. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> no, not a lawyer. Working at a, you know, at a desk somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> so but tell me about your actual first scene. My first scene was, um, it was Come Fiesta. Oh, my God. You're like the third girl who's told me that their first scene was Come Fiesta. It's every, that's how the they get you. That's how they get you. They get you with the cum fiesta. It is like their favorite thing to break the cherry is with a fucking cum fiesta. Like everybody that I know, their first scene is a cum fiesta. And if it's not, you're weird. Like get the fuck out. You're not part of the club. You know, like you're not part of the cum fiesta club. <laughs> so it was like, I remember being like so fucking unbelievably, unbearably nervous. Like I was literally like, ooh, like I was like shaking. I didn't know what to like. I wasn't like familiar with, you know, cleaning out. They handed me a douche and I was like, what the fuck am I supposed to do? Do I stick it in my ass? Like, what do I do with this? Do I drink it? Like I had no idea. And I had to go and douche. And like, I hadn't like mastered my, you know, my, um, my clean out like technique, my clean out routine for like a porn yet. So like, this was just very new for me. And I remember I cleaned out, I showered, I just did what I had to do. And then I put on the little outfit. They gave me a kind of like a basic line of like what I need to do. And I remember like, I was just so fucking nervous. I don't even remember. It was like kind of a blank, but when I got to the point where like we had to like do the sex, I remember like I just went primal. Something inside of me just shut down. Like I turned off and I just like did it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know if I was good or not. I was really insecure about it. I remember like kind of just laying there with my eyes closed. Like I was like, not like being violated, but I was just like, oh my God, what the fuck am I doing? You know? (laughs) Cause I was like young and naive and nervous and I remember like in that moment, I'm like, my dad's going to fucking kill me. Like this <laughs> fucking sucks. I'm like, holy shit. I'm sorry, mom. Like, I don't know. Like I was like freak. I was geeking out a little bit. I'm not yeah. going to lie, but I just, I got through it. And then I remember when they were done, they, uh, the director or no, the, the male talent that I worked with that day, he took me back to the model house that I was staying at and he was so cute. He was so gracious. He was like, she was fucking amazing. One of the best we, we've had so far. Blah, blah, blah. Like they always say that about all the mm-hmm. old whores, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. Like, thanks. <laughs> I know I wasn't that good, but it was like, he was being so sweet. So I felt very, right out of the gate, very welcomed and mm-hmm. very loved and held. And like, there was like nothing to be, be afraid of. Nobody's going to like make fun of me. Like I felt very, very welcomed with mm-hmm. open arms by everyone, mm-hmm. you know, even though I felt in my heart, I was like, oh, that was the first scene ever that was like trash. I laid there mm-hmm. like a freaking baby, you know, like I didn't know what I was doing. But after that, I think I got into the motion of things and I, I got, you just get the hang of it. It's like riding a bike. Eventually mm-hmm. you don't you're not so nervous. Eventually you get used to being in hair and makeup. Eventually like the routine becomes a thing. And then you just, you just get used to it and you kind of work into like a routine of like how you open up to camera. And like, it, yeah. I had to learn that as I went on though. Like there were so many things I didn't know in the beginning. I didn't know to point my toes. I didn't, mm. I didn't know my angles, you know, like there was like certain things that I didn't know how to do yet. So like some of my very first scenes are like my most embarrassing ones. Cause I had no fucking idea what I was doing. Like, yeah, I was just timid and I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> yeah. But I mean, that's the case for everybody, right? you know? I mean, most of the time. Yeah, for sure. What is, so because I've, this name has come up so frequently lately and I actually don't know anything about like the scene. What is a cum fiesta scene? It's basically like, 
it's such a typical like reality kings style shoot very like amateur some girl walks up to your door and you know it's in pov the guy opens the door and and she's like hi i'm here for the cum fiesta and he's like yeah you want to suck this dick baby and then she's like yeah that's why i'm here fuck me (laughs) and then that's how it happens it's so dumb but okay (laughs) i was picturing like a gangbang in a mexican restaurant i don't know i was way (laughs) way off (laughs) <laughs> it might as well be that too. It's it's, it's equally as strange and <laughs> random. It is, you know, but it's yeah, that's basically what it is. It's very amateur and I think that people like that. They like the idea of a girl going up to your door and saying, "Hey, I want to fuck you." Like it's yeah. like a fantasy thing. Yeah. And it works cuz people freaking love it. Yeah. They love it. And yeah. especially when they get those brand new girls that are so green and like mm-hmm. they look just brand new. They mm-hmm. act brand new. They're not like showing up like a porn star that's mm-hmm. been doing this for 10 years and is like, it's like, hey, daddy, you know, yeah. eh. like it's a yeah. girl. It's like, hey, hi. <laughs> <laughs> I want to have sex. <laughs> you know? so, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, they like it. I think it feels accessible. Totally. Yeah. Um, so what was your first year in the industry like? I mean, I know you talked about your first couple of scenes, but like mm-hmm. overall, what was that first year like? Um, it was cool. It was a blast. I had a lot of fun. I did a lot of drugs. I partied a lot. I made so many friends and like I, I but as far as like the shooting aspect of it, I learned a lot. I, like I said, I had to like get into the motion of learning how to point my toes. I ended up falling madly in love with this fucking guy in in the industry. I won't say his name, but it was, I think the motivation of like my feelings for him really motivated me to want to be the best performer that I could be. And and like fucking him off camera all the time. Like it really trained me to like, understand like, this is how I open up. This is how I, and he taught me, he literally trained me Mm -hmm. like a, like a, like a dog. Like it was kind of cool. Like I'm grateful for that. But it really helped me in the sense that like whenever I would show up on set, I had that confidence because when I first got into porn, I wasn't sexually experienced. I had sex maybe like seven times, eight times my entire life. So I had like lost my virginity, like right almost when I was out of high school, had sex one more time, like right before I turned 18 and then slept with a couple guys at a party and then whatever, you know, and like then I got into porn. So like I didn't know what the hell I was doing. So this guy that I was around with, he kind of opened things up for me, like opened up my sexual, he like sexually woke me up. Mm-hmm. And so I was able to like navigate myself through the industry with that. And it really helped. Mm-hmm. Um, within my first year though, it was really easy. It was really cool. Um, I had a scene that came out and it just blew up on Pornhub. I don't know why. I don't know how. What was the scene? It's it's called Kimmy Granger Likes It Rough. Okay. It went fucking nuts. It was like the second most viewed scene right under Kim, Kim Kardashian's sex tape on Pornhub for years. Wow. For years. And Who like, was your partner in it? It was Chad. Chad White. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but he, when that came out, I was just, I was like confused. I'm like, that scene's not even that good. Like, I remember like that day I had a fucking, you know, I had a rash. I had a yeast infection. I wasn't feeling good. I was fat, like not fat, but like I you felt bloated. I felt bloated. Mm-hmm. I was like starting my period soon. My hair was kind of a mess. Like it was just not, it was just another day on set where I'm like, okay, let's wrap this shit up. Let's get it over with, you know? So <clears throat> I mean, looking at it now, can you see why it went viral? Or are you still like perplexed? You know, I literally just went back and tried to rewatch it just to see, cause people still talk about it to this very day. That is where I got recognized that is where my name shot out was because of that scene so sometimes I go back and I'm like I still don't get it but okay if you guys like it then cool like that's awesome thank you thank you for the recognition if that's the scene that was my undoing then awesome you know I'm grateful (laughs) for that but like I don't get it I was you know once again my toes weren't pointed I was just kind of like you know just new I had like this new but maybe that's what what they liked probably what it was yeah I don't know But when that happened, it was, I hit number one on Pornhub and it was just off to the races. Wow. Yeah, it was really cool. So you got in at uh, 19. Mm -hmm. Um, There's been, I've talked to so many different performers about feeling like 
when they got in that early, it was too soon and they should have waited till later. I've also talked to performers who were like, no, I was ready at Mm -hmm. 18, 19. There's like so much controversy over whether or not the age for getting into porn should be raised. Mm -hmm. How, how, what was your experience like? Well, I can see why that would be a debate because if I knew then what I know now, I feel Mm -hmm. like it would be better it would be different obviously my performance I I don't know I I think about that sometimes but I'm really glad that I got in when I was young because I could spend all of my 20s growing and learning and 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 like um what's the word I'm looking for uh expanding in the industry like if I started right now I would be older I would Mm -hmm. be more experienced sure but like I would be older and like I would have like kind of my time would be coming up soon mm-hmm. in in some sense like in porn years you know mm-hmm. so I'm I liked that I got in I almost wish I got in when I was 18 like right out of high school like mm-hmm. even earlier so I had even more time but it happened exactly when it was supposed to but I think it's beneficial for girls to get in when they're younger I do mm. because you can grow with yourself in the industry like if it's something you really really want to do and mm-hmm. it's something you have a passion for. Like if you're just a born bread slut and you want to get into porn, do it when you're young mm-hmm. and have fun with it and blow up and go have mm-hmm. fun with it, you know, and spend as much time as you can in it because there is a time frame until mm-hmm. you're eventually like, you know, you got to make some decisions on like what you want to do with yourself and your life. It's a lot of pressure. Yeah. It's a lot of societal pressure. It's a lot of pressure like, you know, because our brand is reliant on our bodies and our health and our youth and whatever. So if you're, you know, getting that start out young, I feel like that's more beneficial, right? Yeah. I mean, you have a longer trajectory. I guess it just depends on what, it also depends on what your brand is. Like there's some women who have like Mrs. Robinson's a great Mm -hmm. example. She's in her fifties and she got in like in her fifties, but her brand is MILF. Oh, for sure. Like she's like the MILF. She's like the sexy housewife. Like that's her thing. And that suits her perfectly. So, um, yeah, I think it just depends on like how you're going to market yourself. No, totally. And so for me, it was the teen thing. So Mm -hmm. I, I had no other avenue because I wasn't, I didn't look like you know, I didn't have my boobs done. I had the small boobs. I was all natural. So it worked for me. Mm-hmm. But yes, if you have like big tits and you're more like in the milfy category, then cool. And then there's like the, you know, the Madison Ivies. She's stunning and she's hot bitch. Like mm-hmm. she's hot girl porn. Mm-hmm. She's not milf. She's not teen. She's just hot girl porn. So there are different categories for different times to get in. Mm-hmm. I, so I think it is, I think it's just, it just depends Yeah. for me. Like if you're like a young girl and you're cute and have small boobs and whatever, then get in young and work the teen shit. It's a yeah. great niche and it's really, really like lucrative. I think like the only time when I see it being a problem getting in young is when you, <clears throat> sometimes you're impulsive when you're young and you don't really think things through oh, yeah. and porn is not for everybody. No, I think we can, everybody in porn can confidently say that it's yeah. like a great job for like I always quote Asa Akira because I feel like she said this so perfectly. Yeah. She's like, porn is a horrible idea for most people, but for like a small amount of people, like a small percentage, it's like a great job. It's a great decision. Yeah. So you have to know that this is something that you're comfortable with, mm-hmm. you're comfortable with your sexuality. You're definitely an exhibitionist. Mm-hmm. You're not just doing it for the money because if mm-hmm. you're doing it just for the money, like no amount of money will ever make it feel okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and that you are also like, okay with the stigma that comes along with it. Like you, you know, have thought through like how your family might react, like how, what your future might look like. Like if you've really considered all of these things, Mm -hmm. then it can be a fabulous, um, career choice for you. Mm -hmm. But if you haven't and you get in just cause like, "Ah, I don't know. And then you find that like, it is not suited for you. The unfortunate thing is, is that what you've done is out there forever. It will follow you forever. And then also too, I just see a problem with younger people and even Dude, this is something that I'm still working on at 44. How old am I? 44? I think I'm 44. I just turned 44, right? Am I 44? I don't know. Or 43. I think I'm 44. 21. Pretty sure. 21. I'm 21. (laughs) At my age of 21, I still uh, struggle with this, is setting boundaries. Yes. Right? That I think is the hardest thing to do. And that's harder for younger people. And if you don't have if you get started with a bad agent Mm. or you get caught up with the wrong people and you don't know like how to say no, you can 
go down the wrong path. Definitely. And it, like I said, it just depends on where you're at in life. And yeah, those, there are the, the repercussions that come with it, the consequences, of course, like I, you have to go in with grit. Mm -hmm. You do, you need to go in and you need to be strong. You need to tough it out because this is not for everybody. And you need to be, you need to have that mindset. Like, I don't give a fuck what people think. My family finds out then, and they want to diss me for this and then disown me, like, fuck them. You know, that's, that was the mindset that I went into it with because I was already like, fending for myself Mm -hmm. at that time in my life you know I wasn't getting along with anybody anyway so I was like fuck you yeah like I'm gonna go do me yeah you know and I didn't and when they did find out though it was everything was chill like nobody judged me and I'm grateful for that but you know it 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 is it's it just depends on the life that you're living it depends on what's in your heart depends on you can't be sensitive (laughs) you can't you can't be hard on yourself you have to have grit you for also, sure. I feel that you also kind of have to have that if you're just going to be in entertainment anyways. Mm-hmm. Like if for you're sure. just going to put yourself out there, especially now with social media and oh, everyone yeah. in the world getting to like chime in in the comments on Instagram, like what they think about you. If you're going to go into a career path where your job is literally to appear in front <clears throat> of the world and put yourself out there, like. Yeah. You're opening the door yeah. for criticism in yeah. anything that you do. Right. It's, you got to just be okay with it. Yeah. And that's with anything Hollywood singing, whatever it's, Mm -hmm. people are going to be mean regardless of where you're at. So completely agree. How do you handle that? Like trolls on social media, like negative feedback. (gasps) Fuck the trolls, dude. I, I, so back in the day, like the old me used to just play with them. You Mm -hmm. know, if they would say some shit, I would just slap them on a grill and fry them for Mm -hmm. 20 minutes, you know, but now I'm just like, whatever I block and delete, block and delete, block and delete, block and delete, block and delete. I'm like, I don't need that negativity in my life. Fuck you. Mm -hmm. So I do a lot of blocking and a lot of deleting and I do not let it affect me. Like I don't. Cause I'm just like, you're just a little bitch, dude. You're just (laughs) sad and miserable in your own weird weirdo ass life. And you're going out of your way to like, come at me. Like, who the fuck are you? Mm -hmm. You know, like, okay. Yeah. (laughs) I've always felt that the way people treat you is more indicative about how they feel about themselves Mm -hmm. rather than how they feel about you. Mm, For sure. There's a lot of people out there with a ton of shame and fear around sex Mm -hmm. and like you're the perfect candidate attack. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're the perfect punching bag because they can take out all like their fears and like their misogyny and Mm -hmm. and everything against. Definitely. It's funny because I kind of forget the kind of vitriol that you guys experience because I don't get it so much. I mean, don't worry. I get it. Like, yeah. go read my YouTube comments. Um, I mean, <laughs> like, they can be pretty mean sometimes. Yeah. But uh, I think because I'm not a performer, I don't I don't get it as much. Mm-hmm. And I recently did a podcast with Adriana Chechik, and I released a reel, and then I tagged her as a collaborator, and she accepted, so it w- got pushed out to all of her fans as well. Mm-hmm. And I went through, and I was reading the comments. I was like, holy shit. Like there was so much nastiness in Mm -hmm. there, just really, really mean stuff um, just about how you're worthless, you're used goods. I mean, just like everything that you can imagine. And I was like, wow, this is stuff that you guys face Mm -hmm. every day all the time. Yeah, it's nasty. It's it's fucking nasty. It's not, you know, and at first I remember in the beginning, like when it started happening, like I really let it affect me. Mm -hmm. I did. It used to it used to break my fucking heart because I'm like, oh my God. Like I would allow that to consume me to the point like I wanted to fucking kill myself. Like Mm -hmm. now, I mean, now I'm like, fuck you. Like Mm -hmm. I know my worth and I know my value and like what I bring, what I've brought to the table to myself, my family, to the industry. Like there's nothing that anyone can tell me. Like you're just a miserable fuck and you're jealous and you want to fuck me. That's so, you you can't. So fuck you. It's also weird because these are, people who are following you on so like they've yeah, chosen like, to follow you and yeah. watch your career and watch your yeah now you can't follow me now mm. yeah you and know, watch now your I'm content you. and and they just want to like attack you it's just really bizarre yeah it's so weird I'm like whatever dude but yeah no I think like for I would the best advice I would give to like new girls is just block and delete block and delete block and delete like if you see any negative comments like when I post something on Instagram now that when I, anytime I do it, like I spend the whole day going through the comments and sifting through them and filtering out the shit. 
Mm-hmm. I do it because I don't want that shit in my life. I don't want that negativity on my page. If I go and l- read the comments, I want to see nothing but you're amazing. You're beautiful. I love you. You're my favorite. Just uplifting me. I don't want to mm-hmm. see like, oh, your dad must be so proud or you're fucking disgusting. Like you're going to hell, whatever. You know, like my dad is proud, by the way, not proud of this, but he's proud of me. He's proud yeah. that I'm happy. I'm stable. Like, you know, and so people don't think about those things. Like you don't know my life. Yeah. You don't know what, you don't know shit. Like you think that, you know, you, there is a stigma. Course. Like you're putting, you're putting like a stereotype on Fuck something yes, and of course, it's not anywhere <laughs> near you. like what you think it is. Thank That's you guys so much for watching. We will see I also know? find, you know what I find interesting? Where I find I that your dad dicks. must be proud more comment dicks. interesting <laughs> because it suggests that your value only rests in how your father sees you. Like on how another man, like if, if like, you know, the man in your life, your father doesn't mm-hmm. like consider you valuable, then therefore you have no value. And like people have complicated family relationships. Totally. I mean, some people don't have dads, No, absolutely. you know, or no relationship with their fathers whatsoever mm-hmm. or their dads are shitty. Oh yeah. So like, why does your value have to be measured in like what your father thinks of you? No, it's absolutely. just like a strange kind of misogynistic, archaic Oh yeah. Thing, you it know. It goes so deep, but yeah. you know, I just let him think that cuz I know my relationship with my dad. Mm-hmm. And you know, I bought him a home. Like I take care of him. I love him. Like mm-hmm. I want my dad to be proud of me. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't ever want him to think that I went into this to hurt him. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't want anybody to think that I went into this to to affect them or piss him off or anything. Like I went into this because I wanted it. Mm -hmm. I really genuinely feel like it's the right thing for me. I love it. I Mm -hmm. love, 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 love this job more than anything. I pick it over boyfriends. I pick it over anyone. Like Mm -hmm. it's my life. It is my love. And so my, my dad and I have like built such a tremendous relationship throughout this journey of me being in the industry. And that's like something that I don't show on social media because I don't want, I don't want my dad to be attacked. I don't want anybody to see that. You know, and I don't want them to like say any weird shit about my dad because I love my dad and my dad mm-hmm. loves me and like we're chill, like mm-hmm. we're good, you mm-hmm. know. And I know that in my heart. So like when they say shit like that, I'm like block and delete. Bye. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you did say when you first got it started though that you were like not getting along with your family. I did, wasn't. So then that relationship changed over time. It did, and surprisingly, it this like it was like almost like porn brought my dad and I closer together. Interesting. Which is like crazy you would never think right Mm -hmm. but like my dad and I never were like super close Mm -hmm. you know I was always focused on my mom Mm -hmm. you know my mom was an alcoholic and she was just gone she was just you know done Mm -hmm. she was Mm -hmm. done with life and she checked the fuck out a long time ago and I was always focused on her I'm like come back come back I love you I love you and like my dad and I were always like up and down and like whatever like I didn't really I didn't really bond with him too much growing up um he was very good to me. My dad and I had a good relationship. He always took good care of me, but I was, I had a better, better relationship with my mom because I was constantly trying to get her to stop drinking, constantly get her, try to get her to like love me and like change for me and like whatever. And it didn't work. And I just kind of let the, the rejection consume me and drive me into the decisions of just not giving a fuck, which Mm -hmm. eventually led me into porn, which somehow you know brought me closer to my it's it's weird how it worked out I don't really Mm -hmm. know how or why but it worked out in my favor and super grateful for that but my dad when he did find out it was traumatizing he was Mm -hmm. mortified he didn't he wanted to die like he was like what the fuck did I do wrong to make like what did I do wrong as a father Mm -hmm. you know no dad wants this for their kids you Mm -hmm. know it's common but he well, I think like no parent wants to think of their child in a sexual way. No. So when you're going out and having like sex on camera for the world to see, it's uncomfortable for yeah, all parents because exactly. you don't, you know. Yeah. So he, exactly. And so like he, he, he it disturbed him and I gave him the space that he needed. And then some months down the road after he found out, I would always reach out to him. I'd be like, hey dad, I'm just checking on you. I love you. I'm just sending you a text to let you know I'm still here whenever you're ready. I love you. You know, like I'm, I'm I love you. You know, mm-hmm. whenever you're ready to talk to me, I'm here. I love you. Like mm-hmm. I'm not doing this to hurt you. And one day he finally reached out to me and I guess he went and saw a movie that like touched his heart and reminded him of, you know, there's so many other things to worry about and there's so many things to be grateful for and like he'd rather have 
a daughter that does porn than a daughter that's dead, basically. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And he had a lot of guidance from his friends and he had a buddy that um, also had lost a daughter to cancer and it was horrible. And he said that to my dad. He was like, listen, I wouldn't give a fuck if my daughter was banging the Dallas Cowboys, the entire team. Mm -hmm. It's like, I just would rather have her back here. And my dad was like, you know, I think that that really like affected him. Yeah. That's a powerful message. Yeah. And so he, he finally came to me and it was just like amazing after that. Yeah. And then he was probably, once you had him back in your life, was he then able to see that like maybe the industry wasn't as harmful as we've all been taught that it is. Yeah. Well, cause I, I told him, I made it very clear to him. Like I'm safe. I'm happy. I'm not on drugs. Like I'm, listen, I'm not perfect. I was having fun, but I wasn't like, you know, my dad looked at porn, like the Linda Lovelace days, mm-hmm. you know, where like the women were getting trafficked and beaten and, and, and like, you know what I mean? And getting kind of like treated like shit. Mm -hmm. Those are like the, the, the different era of porn. That's, it's not like that anymore. And I explained that to him, like everything is so careful and documented and like by, by a very specific book and like the women in the industry are like respected to a extremely high degree. Like we are treated like princesses and Mm -hmm. like, they love us and like nobody. And once again, like it's not perfect, but I had never had a bad experience. You Mm -hmm. know, I was always treated with the utmost respect by everyone. And I told my dad that it's like, I'm safe. I'm good. I'm happy. Mm -hmm. Just be grateful for that. Like I'm financially stable. Things are good. And then he ended up being, you know, he, now he's my manager. Like he manages all my finances. He helps, he does like all my bookkeeping and like, we're like a, like a team. Wow. So it's really cool. Yeah. So it's super cool. So he, you know, it worked out. My dad is like completely, he doesn't even think of porn as porn anymore. He literally says it like P-O-R-N. Like it's just a word. Like I don't fucking care. You know, <laughs> he's like, just as long as you're happy, you're making money, things are good. Like I'm good. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think once people start to see like how the industry you works, like, and, mm-hmm. and there's like different sides of the industry. I mean, you mentioned like the Linda Lovelace days, Linda Lovelace days. Yeah. I will say that the industry is like so much better now than it yeah. used to be just in terms of how we treat the performers. I think also like the onset of OnlyFans and like mm-hmm. the fact that like perform, it gave so much power to the performers because you guys yeah. now have oh, like yeah. the financial independence that you never had before. Mm-hmm. Totally fucking changed the way that brands treat performers. Yeah. Um, I, it's ironic that this has made the industry better, but it's more corporate mm-hmm. <laughs> than it used to be, which is like good in some sense and bad in another sense. Good in the sense that like corporations really... Um, like structure and they like to play by the rules and they're always like terrified of getting sued. Yeah. So I think they're just like, let's do all of these things to make sure that like everybody's happy and no one's going to sue us. There's no liabilities. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's where like the boundary checklists come in and Mm -hmm. stuff like that. And like the talent liaisons and all this stuff that we have on set now. Yeah. But even like back then, I mean, there's definitely tons of horror stories. Um, but I also think like it's not as bad as people like to think it is because Mm -hmm you know, the mainstream media has been feeding the idea of porn as a violating act, as, you know, exploiting women, as trafficking women forever, you know? So that's the narrative that has been fed to the world for all eternity. And the only reason that I feel like it's even changing now is the accessibility from things like social media, Mm -hmm. from platforms like um, podcasts and stuff, Mm -hmm where performers and people who work in the industry can actually come forward and say like, this is actually my experience and this is my life, Yeah, you know, because it's like, why don't you allow sex workers to speak for themselves and tell you about their experience? Or, you know, I mean, you might find people like documentaries specifically, no shade. Um, (laughs) (laughs) There's a documentary crew here filming today, but they're going to like paint us in an amazingly wonderful light. (laughs) (laughs) um but like cherry picking Mm -hmm. the worst stories that they can find like Mm -hmm. they're the performers who had a terrible experience and those experiences are valid too by the way I don't ever want to suggest that they're not there's all different kinds of experiences but they love to like ignore the people who are like actually this has been a great experience for me because like I don't know people want to turn on the tv and they want to hear about these horrible stories and they want to hear about this shocking like 
you know, porn life. No. Um, like when people were like, actually, like it made me financially independent. I bought a house. I bought a house for my dad. Yeah. Like I'm managing my finances. I'm actually like doing really well. That's mm-hmm. not exciting to people. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's, that's so true. It's people, they want to have a stigma against it because some people just cannot wrap their mind around how someone can be so vulnerable in that position. Mm-hmm. Like how you can literally get stripped down, get naked and have sex in front of a camera and put it out for the world to see. Like it's, it is mind boggling mm-hmm. to people. And I get that. Yeah. I understand if I wasn't in porn, I'd be like, Oh my God, I probably could never do that, you know, yeah. in another life. But so I can see why people like find it so mind boggling, mm-hmm. but there are people that are fucking down for it and are cool enough to do it. And so like, be grateful for that instead of yeah. like attacking us about it, be grateful that we are here to provide you the shit that you need to have an orgasm. Yeah. You're yeah. welcome. Like, <laughs> what the fuck? Like, instead of attacking me, yes, my dad loves me. And also, you're welcome. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> you know? I also think about how the fact that the two things that sell the best in media is sex and fear. So if you combine those two yeah. into, like, a tragic story of, like, a fallen porn star, it's like, mm, 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 the oh, no. ratings. Yes. <laughs> so good. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick commercial break, and then we will be right back. With all the bad news about prices these days, it's nice to know that Adam and Eve is still offering the best deal out there. Adam and Eve is your one-stop shop for everything sexy. It's got toys, games, movies, and so much more. Whether you're single and looking to impress a new partner, or you're in a relationship and you need to spice up your sex life, Adam and Eve has what you need. They've been at the top of the adult retail chain for decades, and there's a reason for that. Now my listeners will get 50% off of any one item, and that's not all. You also get three bonus sexy items and six movies for free, plus free shipping. No matter what you choose from the privacy of your own home, you can rest assured that it will be shipped to you in discreet packaging. So go to adamandeve.com, select any one item at 50% off, plus enjoy three sexy gifts and free shipping with the code Holly. That's adamandeve.com and use code Holly. You have to use my code in order to get this special deal. All right, everybody, we are back. Uh, so Kimmy, you became extremely popular. You were a Brassers contract star. Um, you had, you were number one on Pornhub. How did, how did like all of that fame affect you? Um, I don't really like to think that it affected me in a, in a cocky way. Cause I, that was, no pun intended. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I couldn't help so myself. Funny. <laughs> no, I, um, I remember like telling myself that in the beginning, like if shit ever popped off and like I did something happen, like I'm going to stay humble. I'm going to stay cool. I'm not going to let this like destroy my personality because I am bubbly and I'm fun and I like to laugh and joke and be myself. And so I'm like, I'm not going to let this destroy me. And so that was, it was a conscious effort. It did get to my head a couple of times. I'm not going to lie. There were some times where I'm like, I'm fucking amazing. <laughs> Fuck all you, Fuck all you bitches. Like, you know, but like I, 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 I was always humbled by, you know, something. There was always something that like reminded me, okay, you're still human. We're all human. Chill the fuck out. You're, you're just, it's just porn. Relax, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that staying in my element too, staying home and living in San Diego with my family, staying around my friends and like only going to work and back really helped because it kept me grounded and it kept me in a place of familiarity like that reminds me of who I used to be before this. Mm -hmm. Being around all my friends that I grew up with and being around my family who raised me and like whatever else, that's what kept me grounded. Mm -hmm. I feel like there's a lot of people in this industry that lose sight of that. You know, they, mm. they end up like, like moving to LA or moving to Miami or Vegas or whatever and getting caught up in the scene and getting, blowing so much smoke up their own ass. They forget who they really are and then they just become like, and I always thought that was so nasty. You mm-hmm. know, I always looked at it. I'm like, ew, stop. Like, don't be that guy. Don't do that. Don't, don't be that girl. Like, don't, don't be that person. Mm-hmm. Just don't. Yeah. Like you're really, you're not like, 
don't stick your finger up your own ass and sniff it. Don't be that weirdo. Yeah. You know, I don't know. It just, it always like grossed me out. So I think that by keeping myself grounded with the friends that would like be like, you're, you're still that weird ass bitch in middle school that like did that thing. And like, remember who you are, you know? Mm -hmm. And like that really, really helped. I'm like, okay, that's right. I'm not like this little princess that, Mm -hmm. you know, people try to make me out to be, or, you know, I don't know. I just, I just tried to, I just tried to keep that, that person inside of me that I was when I was a kid, when I was in high school, when I was in middle school, like Mm -hmm. just try to stay humble. You have to stay humble. You cannot let this shit consume you. Advice to new girls. Like (laughs) you're getting in, like stay humble, stay yourself. Like don't let this shit turn you into a monster because it's not. I think it's also like having family and friends who mm -hmm. knew you from before there to ground you, I think is such an important. Yeah important thing to have and not everybody has that you know what I mean um so I can see how that would be difficult because yeah I mean for me like first of all I I really don't think I'm a big deal anyways but like if I started to feel that way you You know like my siblings are just like shut up shut the fuck up yeah no totally and like I if you know obviously there are people that get into this that don't have that yeah availability in their life to keep them you know, regrouped and grounded and remind remind them who they are. So like, I think the best thing to do in that sense is to pick your friends wisely. Mm -hmm. Choose people in your life that make you, that make you feel safe, that don't make you feel like you need to be someone that you know you're not Mm -hmm. because that can happen too. Like you can get caught up in the wrong group of people Mm -hmm. in this industry that will like turn you into literally a fucking monster. Yeah. I don't know. I've seen it time and time again. And that was just a motivation. And people always told me like when I would walk on set, they're like, we love your energy. We love you. You're so goofy. You're so fun. And Mm -hmm. like, I wanted to always keep that in people's minds. I don't ever want people to think that I'm just this. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, I don't ever want that because that's not who I am. I'm right kind of grimy and like I like to sit in my sweatpants and and gorge on burritos and fart in my couch cushion like I'm not like a wow it's hot do you know what I mean yeah I'm not this like I don't know so I just just try to keep that stable Mm because it can get to your head yeah it can it can it can get you and creep up really hard you've mentioned that um you regret getting your boobs done oh yeah do you want to talk about yeah let's talk about it um I freaking you're like (laughs) These Here, fucking let me things. Hit you up first. These <laughs> stupid things. Yeah. Well, so I got my boobs done in 2020, January of 2020, and I got them done after my mom passed away, and I wanted something for myself. My mom and I were supposed to get boob jobs together. It was like going to be our thing, and like I was going to like get hers because she has her boobs done or had her boobs done, but she ended up. Um, never getting them like redone. And I was like, it's okay, mom. Like we're going to get them together. And then she ends up passing away. And I was like, fuck this. I'm going to go do this for me. And I'm going to do it for my mom as well. Like I was like the grief, it was the grieving that took over, Mm -hmm. you know, grief makes you do crazy shit. It really does. And the grief drove me into making a really weird mistake that I can't turn back from. I really can't. Like I, I marketed on being all natural. I marketed on having cute little boobs. They loved my boobs. Nobody ever had shit to say about me mm-hmm. because I I stayed true to myself, you know, and I lost sight of that because I was depressed and like grieving and I needed to like feel like- You wanted I was, something to make you feel better. I wanted something to make me feel better. And I felt like it was time. I'm like, I've been in the industry for five years. Like I've had a great career. Like I've done a lot. Like I have a flashlight. Everything's cool. Like I I did all the things. It's cool. You mm-hmm. know, so I like justified it in my head. I got them done. Lo and behold, the doctor, when I went to my consultation, she ends up putting or telling me she wanted to put a textured implant inside of me. And I was like, fuck no, I don't want a textured implant. Like that sounds so weird. She's like, yeah, your boobs are kind of kind of like stay in place. And I'm like, no, I want them to be like bouncy and natural. Mm-hmm. And like, I don't want them to look weird, you know? The day of the surgery, they fuck me up. They give me some drugs. They give me something to like ease the nerves. And she comes in while I'm fucked up and talks me into getting that textured implant when I didn't want it at the consultation. When I was will and sound, she talked me into it when I was fucked up on drugs. Lo and behold, it turns out she gets a commission from like upselling those. 
She took completely advantage of me. I, I'm like two weeks into healing from my boob job and someone like sent me a link that the specific implant that I had inside of me was being recalled everywhere for causing cancer and all this crazy shit. And I'm like, great. Oh That's God. fucking awesome. Like, thanks a lot. Thanks for fucking nothing, you know? So I ended up having to give it six months. You have to wait six months until you can get them redone. And I, ooh, excuse me. I wait six months, I get them redone. And then the doctor that I got them redone by, he puts them in too far apart. And one of them was like, they were like going like that. They looked fucked up. And I'm like, oh my God, this is getting so much worse. I'm like, I'm literally like digging myself deeper into a fucking grave. I'm like, yeah. this is horrible. And so, and then anytime I would lay down, they would like literally slide into my armpit. So I was just all sternum and implants. Oh, <laughs> it was no. so bad. It was so They're fucking like googly bad. eyes. Oh, they look like shit. They were horrible. And I was just like, this is the, my worst nightmare. But whatever. I got obviously got to get them fixed. My yeah. body is reliant on my life. Like I have to look good and I have to feel good. So January of 2021, I get them redone again. I get it done by a doctor up here in LA and he does a fucking lobotomy on them. He does everything he could. He did the best that he could. But because I have a wide breastplate, I didn't know this before. No doctor told me about this. So implants naturally will sit farther apart on me because that's how my breastplate is. Mm -hmm. I didn't, you know, and the doctor told me this. He's like, they're gonna, you're going to have some rippling in the middle, but they're going to be closer together. They'll be normal-ish. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, just do it. Fix them, please, you know? Mm -hmm. He fixes them to the best of his ability. He puts like what's called an internal bra so they don't like slide into my armpit because mm -hmm. that's where my pocket sits is like farther away, farther mm -hmm. apart. He puts the internal bra in. Everything's cool. But like now my I have, you know, fucked up scars. This one was sewed in too tight. So my nipple like goes down like that. My rippling is just ridiculous. I mean, you could probably see it. Like I've got rippling. Right. You can show me after. Okay, sorry. Just, no, 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 no. I just, you can't show me on YouTube. Because no, 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 no. I, was, I wasn't going to pull my tits out. Okay, <laughs> I mean, you can talk. I have no problem with you pulling your tits out, just for I clarification. Know. I just don't want to get deleted on YouTube. That's all. I got you. But you can totally show me after. But there is no there is rippling in the middle, and then it ripples on the side. I see, it's like, just, a little bit, I think, of what you're talking oh, about. Oh, yeah. You you could definitely see it. You know, and it's it's all I see in the comments now. It's like, I'm just like, don't. I, I, the biggest mistake I ever made in my in, in porn was mm -hmm. getting my boobs done. Nobody wanted me to get my boobs done. Everybody warned me. All of my girlfriends that I had in porn that got their boobs done, they told me not to do it. And I was like, no, 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 no. Like, fuck you, fuck you. Like, I gotta, I gotta learn my own mm -hmm. way, you know? And I learned my own way. <laughs> yeah. Um, I can relate. I had, I had a bad liposuction experience, mm. which I'll explain to you later. So, yeah. um, but yeah, so I've been there, bad decisions. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Horrible. Plastic surgery, man. I know. Yeah. I but you can also like, I didn't do my research really. I thought I did. Yeah. I, I thought I did know. my research. I mean, I did, but I didn't do enough. Yeah, no. Well, and like, that's the thing too, is I have to live with my mistakes now mm -hmm. and I have to try and just pretend like it is, it's, it is what it is, it you is know? And is. if you don't like it, then don't jerk off to me. I'm sorry. Like, fuck you. You know? <laughs> yeah. You might, the real ones stick around and that's cool. Yeah. But I regret it, okay? So stop yelling at me. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> I know they look like shit, you know? So. Um, okay, so let's let's move on to another wonderful, happy topic. Uh, you struggled with drug addiction in the past. And you've been very open about that. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us a little bit about that experience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so after um, the passing of my mom, I started experimenting with, like Percocets and Xanax because it was literally the only thing that was like numbing the pain because mm -hmm. I mean once again grief makes you do crazy shit right mm -hmm. and not only did my mom pass away but also we went right into COVID quarantine so mm -hmm. I was alone Oof. I had to grieve alone so in cool. quarantine in my home I had some connections to get some something to entertain myself I was fucking bored too I'm like it was boredom it was grief and it was fuck it you know so that's so many people start drinking like really actually yeah. i know so you know i'm sober and i'm in like a 12-step program oh cool so many people that i knew 
from like the program mm-hmm. relapsed during COVID. Yeah, def- I can see, I yeah. completely get it because that's how I started. So I ended up um, just here and there would dabble with like, I would get the little bars, like the Xanax bars and I would take like a quarter here, a quarter there every other day. Like just whenever I was feeling crazy or icky and depressed or whatever, like I would just piece off of Xanax and just eat it. Mm -hmm. And then I started mixing them and like taking Xanax with Percocet and finding that was fun as shit. And I'm like, this is cool. I like this. And then I started, you know, and then, you know, half of a or quarter of Xanax turned into half a Xanax. And then that half a Xanax turned into, you know, a a whole fucking bar. And like, it just progressed over time, like over a course of some months, you know, and then I bought my house and I was so stressed out. Like I did not realize the animal that I was taking on when I bought my fucking house. I was on, I'm on, you know, three, three and a half acres of land and I have like gardeners and like all this shit happened when I first bought it. My water heater fuck got fucked up and something wrong with the plumbing. Like it was right out of the gate. Like there was problems and I was just like already on drugs, but I wasn't like on drugs a lot yet. Mm -hmm. And then, um, I had a falling out with a girlfriend of mine. She did something awful and it just disturbed me and I started using harder. And so that's when my, I spiraled, I spiraled out of drugs or out of control on drugs. After that, I was sticking them up my ass. I was snorting them. I was swallowing them. Wait, you I can was, stick them up your ass? You can. Like pills? Mm-hmm. I, was I assume that it that's faster than. It is. It hits quicker. Yeah. You want to wet it a little. No, I'm not going to give advice, but <laughs> I stuck it up my ass and I was also taking them and I was up to like three to four bars a day. Like it was really bad. Wow. And um, one day, I, I guess I was blacking out and like doing crazy shit. I did my very first live on OnlyFans, like fucking blacked out, annihilated. And I had just had an abortion. So I was wearing a fucking diaper and I was like dancing on my OnlyFans, shaking my diaper ass, blacked out of my mind on drugs. Like it was horrible. It was so fucking bad. And everyone called me the next day and they were like, dude, get your shit together. This is not okay. I'm assuming you deleted that off of your OnlyFans. I mean, at least I will say like, at (laughs) least that's on a platform where technically you can't download content. Yeah. Let's be honest, people screen record shit, but still, and then you have control over it. So it can't, yeah. So it was, it was totally fine. It was, it was, I live with my mistakes. I'm not perfect. Mm -hmm. It is what it is. But I, um, I remember, uh, one day my, my best friend came over and she was like, listen, cause she's in this 12 step program. She's Mm -hmm. five, five or six years clean and sober now. Mm -hmm. So she's a sponsor. She's amazing. She's fucking kills it. She came over and she's like, listen, it's time. Like you are blacking out. You're calling people and threatening them. Like you're doing crazy shit. Like you're, you're fucked. Like Mm -hmm. it's time to, and I'm like, okay, fine. You know, I finally hit a point where I was like, okay, Mm -hmm. I I agree, you know? And so I stopped taking them and I didn't taper off of them properly, which Mm -hmm. was really bad. I thought that, I thought that if, I didn't know you, this shit takes like weeks to months. Yeah. When it comes to like opioids, Mm -hmm. you have to. Yeah. Fortunately, I mean, I don't get me wrong. I've taken my share of Percocet and, mm-hmm. and fucking Xanax and all that shit, but I yeah. never took like so much of it because alcohol was always my thing. Mm-hmm. I would take like, like a little bit with alcohol when I had it available. Yeah. But yeah, um, just from my experience in rehab a couple of times, I can tell mm-hmm. you that kicking that is, is really rough. I didn't know. That was the first time I ever like got hooked on drugs like that, mm-hmm. you know? So I, I didn't know. She told me, she's like, you have to taper off and these are going to be your withdrawal symptoms and whatever. And I remember the first day. So what I consider tapering off was just give it three days. Like I was like, I'm going to go from three bars to, you know, one bar at night and then one bar in the morning to half a bar at night, half a bar in the morning to a quarter at night and then a quarter in the morning and then just stop. I thought so you're that, like, I'll be done in like three days. I'll be done in like three days and it's going to be chill, mm-hmm. you know? And so I ended up um, no, 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 no. That was, that was not the, that was not how <laughs> was you not do that experience. at all. So <laughs> I remember the first day of, um, tapering off, she came over and she was, you know, like she checked on me and she's like, how you doing? Blah, blah, blah. And like, I started going crazy. I went into a drug psychosis. I was having, uh, hallucinations. I was starting to have like drug dreams. I remember I woke up from a dream 
really fucked up dream. It was so vivid and fucked up. And I remember waking up and opening my eyes and there was like a drone. It was literally like a drone disguised as like an, it almost looked like R2-D2's like head. It was like Mm -hmm. blinking red and white or red and blue. And it was like, had like a white dome. And I like opened my eyes and I swear my cat saw it too. My cat at the time was like sitting there, like flicking her tail and staring at it. So I fucking lost it. I literally threw the blanket over my head. I was like, no, it's not real. Like I'm like, I freaked out. And I tried to fall back asleep. And then the next day, it was even more excruciating. It was like the tremor started kicking mm-hmm. in, the sweating, the 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 intrusive thoughts, the hallucinations. I was hearing shit in the walls, whispers in the ceiling fans. Like I was going completely fucking crazy. And after, by the third day, I I was gone. Like I was done. I couldn't I couldn't do it anymore. It was agony. It was literal, physical, emotional and spiritual agony. Like I could not bear it for another second longer. Mm -hmm. And I remember my brother came and stayed with me that night because I could not be alone. I was seeing shit. I was hearing shit. I was going fucking nuts. And I looked it up and it just says like, you got to just tough through it, just get through it, get through it. And I'm like fucking going crazy. Right. So my brother sleeps over and he sleeps at the end of my bed on the floor, like on the floor in my room. And I didn't sleep all night. I didn't sleep all night. I stayed up all night, like doing this shit in bed, like looking at the walls, like looking at the ceiling fan, like the walls were talking to me. I was just fucked up. And by four o'clock in the morning, I still hadn't slept. I'd been doing this like all night tremors. Like I was like twitching, like I couldn't breathe my stomach. It felt like someone had a fist around my stomach and was like pulling it out of my belly button. It was horrible. I had diarrhea. Like it was fucked up. Yeah. By the time 4, 4.30 in the morning hit, I call up my dad and left him a voicemail because he didn't answer. He was sleeping. And I'm just bawling my eyes. I'm like, you need to take me to rehab. I can't do this. Like, I need help. Like, please, like, call me as soon as you can. And he's like a medical detox. It was horrible. Yeah. yeah. My dad ends up calling me back within like a matter of minutes. And he said, okay, let's, we're, let's call, you know, call the doctor, the same doctor that detoxed my mom when she had cirrhosis. And I called him up. Thank God he answered. Thank God he's a freaking early riser because I was, I couldn't take another 45 seconds of this shit. And he ends up um, sending his nursing crew like up to my house within by like 11 a.m. that day. And they, the same nurse that detoxed my mom, she saw me and she just fucking like broke down, bawling her eyes out. She was just like devastated. And it started, obviously I'm like so fucked up with my withdrawals. I'm like, don't do this right now, please. Oh my God. (laughs) Like we started crying. My dad's just like, can you guys fucking pull it together? Like, (laughs) let's get this shit done. Like Jesus fucking Christ, you know? So we take me into the room. We start the detox. I did an NAD, like a 15 day NAD detox. Mm -hmm. And the moment, like, I mean, within the the first, I swear, 45 seconds of this shit hitting my system, I, like, I could breathe. Like, Mm -hmm. my, my, my voice, like, stopped cracking. Like, I could, I just felt so calm. I felt so good. It was already starting to, like, you know, my tremors went away. Like, everything went to a happy medium. And mm-hmm. she put a little bit of Ativan in my drip to like taper me off. Mm-hmm. And it was, oh my God, I felt amazing. Mm-hmm. I haven't felt that kind of relief in forever. You yeah. know, I felt like it was like a decade I was feeling like this. And then I like took a nap. I remember just like taking a nap and I closed my eyes and she, she gave me some crackers because I had to take my meds. She gave me, I had like a, a row of meds, like mm-hmm. of just random shit, gabapentin, you name it, everything. And she gave me some crackers because I hadn't eaten in like, I think something crazy, like six days or something. Like I was not eating, like I had to have something in my stomach. And she ends up, I end up just falling asleep. I don't remember like when I fell asleep, but I just remember like falling asleep. And this is probably like two, three minutes into the detox. And I wake up from my nap and they're sitting on the edge of the bed and they're talking about the seizure, the seizure, you know, like they're, they're like talking about some seizure. I'm like, what seizure? Who had a seizure? My dad was like, honey, you had a seizure. And I was like, oh what? God. And he was like, yeah, you fucking, you, I thought we thought you were going to die. Like we literally thought you were dead. Yeah. And the nurse didn't know what to do. She wasn't equipped. She had never dealt with something like this before. 
And my dad didn't know what to do. He's like, the hands of my daughter's life is in this woman's hands who's fucking losing it right now. Like he, she literally was like on the phone with the ambulance. She's like, we lost her. She's gone. She's gone. Like, help me come quick. Like at my, my face went black, like blue. Like I was, my pulse was gone. Like my body went cold. Like it was fucking done. And I guess I had a full blown grand mal seizure, the shock to my system from the detox and from the withdrawals. Like it was just too much. My body like lost it. But I felt fine. I woke up and I'm like, You're you like, guys are fucking tripping. Like, what are you talking about? Well, I just had a nap. I just took me a little nappy nap. What do you mean? Like, <laughs> everything's cool. But my dad was like going, taking me on this like emotional journey that he just went through. Yeah. How he literally thought my, his daughter was going to die and like all this crazy yeah. shit. And thank God I'm okay. Everything's yeah. cool. But like, that was the beginning to my sobriety. <laughs> Not sobriety, but I've been clean off drugs. Yeah. Um two years now almost two years so when was that it was like yeah it was 2020 so I'm almost two years now congratulations thank you I still drink I'm not perfect I like to I'm not an alcoholic though I'm a drug addict so it's um it's different for everybody it it's is. like you know whatever whatever your thing is only you know mm -hmm. what you can handle and what you can't exactly so, so it was it was very interesting and then my girlfriend started taking me to AA and it just wasn't for me mm -hmm. but it helped it mm -hmm. helped me to um take the right steps into the right direction of like not you know staying away from drugs and I felt very held in that moment because mm -hmm. I felt like I had community and support and mm -hmm. I was kind of going through my own shit with it you know mm -hmm. and so it was very nice in that moment to like be understood mm -hmm. but I just I just didn't go through, finish my steps and stuff. I was just like, this isn't for me. I'm, I'm right. okay. I'm very comfortable with what I'm doing. So Right, right. Yeah. I mean, that's that's all that matters mm -hmm. as long as you feel good. Yeah. So, um, so let's talk about your mother because mm -hmm. she's come up so many times. Um, I've seen the posts that you have made about her, you know, on social media about losing her. And I'm always like so incredibly moved and touched by that for two reasons, you know, first of all, you said she's not, she was an alcoholic, mm -hmm. which, which I am a recovered alcoholic or recovering as yeah, you want to say sure. something I struggled with my entire life. So like that very much hits home for me. Mm -hmm. And then just like, I have like kind of a complex relationship with my mother mm -hmm. who like, sometimes I want to kill her. Um, yeah, and then normal. other times I'm just like, you know, the thought of like losing her is just like very painful Unbearable. for me. So, mm -hmm. so tell me, tell me about your mom. So we'll start from the beginning and just kind of break it down. So my mom, when I was a little girl, she was my best fucking friend. She was literally like Barbie. She was my favorite toy. Like I loved her so much. Like I wanted to grow up and be just like her. Like she was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my entire life. I remember like when she'd pick me up from school and her convertible and her hair's in a high pony and she's just so hot and young and happy and like life hadn't eaten her alive yet you know mm -hmm. she was that's how I like to remember her when she was doing her mascara in the car and listening to third eye blind and she was just happy you know and so when I was a kid that's how I always attached myself to her was just this beautiful happy vibrant amazing human being who just loves my brother and I endlessly and like anytime she could have like twenty dollars in her bank account and she would spend 15 of it buying us some toys and whatever we need. If we wanted that stupid toy at the shelf, she would get it. Mm -hmm. And she would starve herself to make sure that we were fed. Like she was very selfless and just, just amazing. She was an amazing mom. And she would play with us, laugh with us, cuddle with us. Like that's why like the dynamic between her relationship with me and my relationship with my dad was so different. Cause my dad's a little more like, you know, mm -hmm. like, militant and mm -hmm. structured and like he wants things to be by a certain book and like he he did his very best and I love him so much like I love them both in their own way mm -hmm. but when I was a little girl my mom was like my my soulmate mm -hmm. you know and so as time progressed you know my mom after she divorced my dad she spent some time not being with anybody and she took care of my brother and I and it was just the three of us and everything was cool we lived in our crappy apartment and you know we'd eat eggs for dinner and like we were kind of broke but it was like it was fun because we had each other and like that's how I like always remembered her and so she ends up getting remarried to this guy 
and they were married for about three years when I was in third grade. That's when they got remarried and I spent fourth grade and fifth grade living with my stepdad and my new step siblings and that was cool and like we had a lavish lifestyle, lived in a big beautiful home and we thought that this was going to be our new life. And when I was in fourth grade, my mom's mom passes away from cancer, completely destroyed her. It, it destroyed her, but it didn't break her down really yet. And then a year later, her dad gets diagnosed with cancer. Oh, and then during that same month, her husband decides that he wants to divorce her and file for divorce. So my mom was just like, nope, I'm done. Mm -hmm. Fuck everything. Fuck life. Fuck my kids. Fuck everything. Like I'm done. I can't, you know, and I, I feel for her. If I was in that position, I couldn't even imagine how I would react, you know, but as a child, I didn't understand. I didn't understand the magnitude of her pain. I was just like, she's being selfish. She's not taking care of my brother and I, you know, so we, he ends up, we end up moving out and she gets alimony and they file, they, they get the divorce. And my mom ends up taking her, bringing her dad down to die in our house from Arizona. And she, it was horrible. I mean, she became a raging, and I mean a raging fucking alcoholic during that time. It consumed her irreparably, mm -hmm. completely. And once again, as a child, I didn't understand. Like, I just, I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what, how to comfort her. I just looked at it like my mom is, I'm losing my mom. You know, mm -hmm. she's gone. What do I do? Like, how do I bring her back? And she, I thought maybe this was just a phase and it wasn't, it wasn't a phase. She was literally, this was going to be her undoing. And she ends up fucking dating out of all the revolving door of men that were going in and out that year. Like when I was in sixth grade, all these men that were coming in and out of my mom's lives. I mean, she was fucking around with all these disgusting guys going to the bars. Like I missed a ton of school. It was a really rough year. She st sticks with this one guy who's the fucking the most disgusting thing I've ever seen or met in my entire life ends up being her husband. She ends up marrying the fucking guy and we end up moving into a shitty situation. And I had to like kind of grow up in this shitty situation, you know, and I was exposed and subjected to a lot of just dark shit. My mom never stopped drinking. She kept drinking harder. He encouraged it. He didn't care like what happened to my brother and I, like it was very like tumultuous and volatile and nasty and like grimy and like I I cling to my dad started clinging to my dad a lot more like through middle school and high school because but but it was devastating for me mm -hmm. because my mom was always that princess that beautiful person that person that I looked up to and I'm like you're amazing you're my soulmate I love you like come back to me but she never did she just kept going dark darker and darker and more and more spiraled out of control and so I kind of had to start distancing myself and, and rejecting her, whatever love she had left for me. It was really hard because I didn't, I couldn't keep torturing myself like this. I'm like, mm -hmm. my mom's not coming back. She's done. And so I started being nasty to her, mean to her, like, fuck her, you know, look what she's done to me. Like, look what she's done to my brother. And I like, I hated her for so long. And, you know, I spent the rest of my time with her fucking hating her and treating her like royal dog shit. Anytime she was drunk, which was all the time, she would, you know, try to love me and hold me. And I would always be like, get the fuck off of me. You're disgusting. You know, mm -hmm. I, how old were you at this time? Fucking high school. So, you know? I mean, you're already going through that stage too, that yeah. like you, <laughs> yeah. unfortunately everyone goes to that stage like in high school where they kind of like hate their parents sort of anyways, Yep. because like you're establishing your independence and there's that whole like weird stage. Yes. And so in addition to that, you have your mom yep. drinking and behaving in, in a way which is mortifying. horrible and mortifying anyway. Yeah. So that's like. But it was just also the fucking husband that she was with. I mean, he was just fucking, I don't even, like, that's a whole nother episode. But he, it was just awful. And by the time I graduated high school, my mom's and my relationship was already, you know, it was yeah. already like kind of buried. It wasn't, there wasn't much left. I love my mom, loved her, still loved her very much, but it was like, she was just too toxic for me, mm -hmm. you know? And I kept thinking, nope, this, she's going to change. Something's going to happen. She's going to have a breaking point. I'm just going to keep my distance. I'm going to keep torturing her, you know, like telling her to fuck off and come talk to me when you're done drinking mm -hmm. and being a piece of shit, you know? 
And lo and behold, without even knowing it, like I was wasting the only years that I had left with my mom, Mm -hmm. you know, and I, by the time I was 25 years old, she dies and I didn't get to last time I, last things that I said to her was you're a fucking joke and I, I fucking hate you literally verbatim you're a fucking joke I fucking hate you go fuck yourself like it was the last things that I said to her and I can never take that back I can never write that wrong I can never she died with that in her heart I'm sure she it's I'm sure it's not that's not the case I know she knows that I love her and I know she knows and I make a I make living amends to my mom every day now Mm. like that's how I bond with her that's how I live out the rest of my lives and my life without her here with me is I make a living amends to her by never treating another person the way that I treated her Mm -hmm. ever again. Like someone's disposable, like someone is, you know, like someone is just a monster and they're not just going through something. I took her completely for granted and it destroyed me. It was the worst pain I ever felt in my fucking life. I don't know. You don't know pain until you lose your mom or your dad. It's, it's awful. I can't even imagine losing my dad, but like my mom, that was horrible because it was, I can never, I I can't, I couldn't, I couldn't take that back. I have to live with that guilt. I have to live with that regret, you know? Yeah. And it's, you know, and I, I don't know. It's, it is, it is hard. It is hard. It's still hard every day, but like I have made so much peace with it because she was such a tormented soul. She was so, so miserable and so tormented and so sad and so, lost Mm. she wasn't serving herself anymore she wasn't Mm. serving anybody not herself not her family not her kids she's not that she deserved to die but she's really better off where she's at she's happy now she's at peace she doesn't have to be in pain anymore and that's fucking awesome I'm happy for her I really am and like I I think about that all the time I'm like if you were still here right now like you would be pissing everybody off yeah you know so I'm so happy for you. Yeah. But it fucking killed me for months. As you imagine, it was, it was awful. Regardless of how her and my relationship was, that does not mean that the the sadness goes out the fucking door. Yeah. It does not mean that I don't still love her, you know? And like, I had people telling me that they're like, yeah, well, your relationship with your mom wasn't that good anyway. So why are you even sad? And I'm like, are you fucking kidding me right now? Like, who the fuck are you to tell me how to grieve over my mom, regardless of what we went through? You don't know, like, why our relationship was bad and why we're at this point. Like, you don't know shit, you know? And so there was nothing that anyone could say. No right thing, no wrong thing. Like, I just shut everyone out and did drugs and was just like, bye. (laughs) Yeah. No, I mean, God, I feel for you so much because it's the hardest thing to love an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. Because the things that we do to ourselves... And the way that we hurt the people who love us, it's oh like, God. it's really hard. And that's it like is. one of the worst things about being an alcoholic. It's like not even, I mean, the way that I hated myself because mm-hmm. of the pain that I saw, like that I put my family through. Wow. Mm-hmm. I didn't think I was going to get I'm this so bad. No, 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 no. But um, so I just want you to know that I know that your mom loved you. And I think that you should not feel guilty about pulling back the way you did because it's not fair to put you through that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And like, that is to have to watch your mom, like slowly kill herself like that. Mm -hmm. That is fucking horrible. And, and you're not responsible. It's not your responsibility to like stick around and like, we're only human. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, for you to be constantly like loving and forgiving and like understand that she's just going through something because Mm -hmm. it's like, it's so hard to understand. Like, even when I was like in the depths of my alcoholism, I was like, why am I doing this to myself? Mm -hmm. Like I remember so often I would like make myself so sick and I would like throw up in the toilet Mm -hmm. and I'd be like sitting there and I'd flush the toilet and I'd feel like as I'm watching like my vomit go down the toilet, like that's my life right now. And I know this and I'm conscious that I'm, I'm throwing my life away and then I'm hurting the people who love me. And like my family didn't know what to do. They'd never like, no one in my family's ever gotten sober. You know, there's mm-hmm. no recovery in my family at all. And I have a lot of alcoholics, especially on my dad's mm-hmm. side. And they just didn't know what to do. 
And, um, and I had no reason to be an alcoholic. Like your mom went through a lot of stuff, you know, Mm -hmm. she had a lot of pain and I can, and in some sense, it feels like that makes more sense. But for me, I had like this wonderful gifted life. I had like people who loved me. I had like Mm -hmm. all of these things. And I still like chose to like, yeah, do, you know, just to, I mean, I was, you know, I was at a state where I was drunk all the time. I was drunk in the morning. Mm -hmm. I started drinking in the morning. And I drank 24 fucking seven mm-hmm. and I had the shakes and I, um, my liver was swollen. Like I was in bad, bad shape. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and so I just, I don't know. It's the worst part is the thing is the pain that we put other people through. And I hope that you don't feel like you did anything bad by feeling the way that you did. You know what I mean? Because like, how, how could you be any other way? And you were young, Mm. you know, and to, to, it's just like, it's so hard. It's, I, I don't like, I, like I said, I have made so much peace with it beyond like the the amount of spiritual growth that I have gone through and the amount of digging that I had to do and the amount of therapy I had to go through to get to this point where like I could talk about it and be like it's okay like I'm okay you know like I don't I don't like freak out and break down and cry about it anymore because like it's it broke me so hard that I don't have anything left in me to give yeah I I broke it already I broke myself enough you know now it's now I'm I'm grateful for the relationship that I get to have with her now Mm -hmm. because she's not, she's, she lives in my heart. She lives in my spirit. She lives in everything that is me. And she always sends me little signs. She sends me songs. She turns on my TV. There's all kinds of weird shit that I, that I like to connect myself to her to knowing that she's still here. She visits me in my dreams. Like there's so many things that I get to experience her in knowing that she's still here with me and we get to bond and we get to now love each other. We don't we're not fighting. We're not yelling. She's not drinking in front of me. She's not doing anything that's pissing me off. I just get to love her now. Yeah. I get to live with so much love for my mom. And that is something I've never experienced before. So it's a blessing. Like I'm, I'm I'm happy for that. I'm grateful for that. Cause I would have probably not be doing that right now if she was still here. Yeah. I would be like in the fuck you stage still. Yeah. You know, just not learning and not, I learned so much from her death. I really did. I learned so much about people and, and, and addiction and people's minds and like healing and growing. I learned a lot. I really did. Yeah. And so it's, it's, it really is okay. Like, um, and how amazing too, just in comparison that you were able to come out of this mm -hmm. and have that perspective and have that personal and spiritual growth from such a tragedy where you look at like how your mom got into where she was because of like being surrounded by a lot of death Mm -hmm. and, it's so it's just like, yeah. it's amazing that you were able to go the other way and in like a weird way. I mean, that's like the gift your mom gave you with her death, you know, mm-hmm. that she didn't get to, she didn't get to experience, yeah. you know, she, she let it break her. Yeah. Life really fucking ripped her apart. Yeah. It really did. I mean, she's beyond her parents dying and going through a divorce, like all within the same like two years. Yeah. I, can't I mean, she was raped a couple of times. Like she's been abused. She's been fucked up with life. Life literally yeah. put her in its mouth, chewed her up and then shit her out and flush her into a sewage line. Yeah. Like she really did not, you know, she had it rough. And yeah, the, I, I think that to touch on what you said, Thank you for recognizing that because that is something that I am really proud of is that I did not let it consume me the way that it consumed her Mm because I very well could have. I have depression. I have suicidal depression. I go fucking crazy. I have in the past, you know, and so that almost took me the way that it took her. Mm -hmm. But something, something is on my side to where maybe it was her that was like, no, got to go through this, but you're not going to let this fucking kill you. Yeah. You're going to be stronger than me. You're going to be better than me, you know? Yeah. And, and, but that was cool. It was like, I looked at it as a cool experience, a learning experience. And I'm, I'll never, reg- I don't regret it. You know, yeah. I don't regret what I went through and I don't regret, I don't regret anything, yeah. you know? And I, I, maybe I had to go through with, with my mom, what I went through in order to learn how to really truly love and respect people, Yeah, you know, and take people not, don't take people for granted, you know, and, 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 
take it one day at a time. Yeah. And not try to change anybody, not try to control anybody. I tried to control and change my mom. My, my, my control issues were crazy with her. Mm -hmm. You know, I spent all this time fucking trying to change her and hate on her and whatever, instead of just spending the time that I had with her. But I didn't know. Yeah. You know, I couldn't have known. So no. it's okay. And I mean, really like, you know, I mean, you're a part of your mother and your yeah. mom lives on through you. So like maybe there's that side of her that could have survived through all that. And that's like you. It's a piece of me. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I like to think that. I mean, I, yeah. And like I said, that's part of what I said about making a living amends to her. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's cool. I'm excited. Yeah. I'm excited yeah. to keep doing that. Because, yeah. You know, I want to make her proud. Yeah. I want to make everybody proud. Well, that's amazing. Kimmy, you're, <laughs> thanks for ruining my makeup, Kimmy. No, Thanks sorry. a lot. You look beautiful. Mm, no. Thank God <laughs> Melissa's makeup really stays. I know, she's the best. <laughs> um, wow. Uh, God, I feel like I just want to talk about dicks to like clear the clear air. Clear the air. <laughs> can we like. It's your grandmother's underwear. Uh, can we talk about dicks? <laughs> Someone bring me down. Seriously. Let's talk about dicks. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> I'm so sorry. I didn't know it was nothing. No, I mean, it was my decision. I was like, oh, like her mom died. She wants to talk about that. This will be great. We'll like get really like yeah. into it and it'll be really emotional. I just, I guess I didn't expect, I thought I would like get a couple tears. I didn't expect my voice to break. <laughs> so, whew, sorry about that. Um, wow. We are, we are going on almost an hour and a half. It's amazing. We're killing it. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, let's let's wrap it up because I still want to do that little bonus Q and A. Yeah. With you, where I can ask you really safe questions, totally. like who your celebrity crush is. What's my favorite color. Yes. Oh my god. Yeah. Please. <laughs> let's like, let's talk about some really like not important shit. Let's do it. Um. Okay. So, but before we go there, let's obviously wrap this one out. Can you tell everybody where they can find you on social media? You can find me on social media, um, through Instagram and Twitter, my Instagram, I have two pages and my original one, like my main one is at stranger than Granger. And then I have a backup account, which is at King Kimmy Granger. And then my Twitter is at, uh, Kimmy Granger XXX. I think. Yeah. Yeah, XXX. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> and uh, you guys can find me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. And of course, if you want to experience me crying in real time, you can watch these interviews live at patreon.com slash Holly Randall and filter it and also access the bonus Q&A we're going to do here. Um, Kimmy, thank you so much. This was like an incredible interview. I'm very, even though like I... I'm also sad. It was amazing and like really, no, really yeah. powerful. And, and these are the kinds of interviews that, you know, for me are like the most important because I feel like I walk away from stuff like this and I like have a new appreciation for my mom yeah. and for life and just totally. new like perspective um, on everything. So That's thank great. you for thank helping you. me like grow as a person too. Fuck yes, of course. Anytime. Yeah. Oh <laughs> thank Incredible. you. Thank you guys so much for watching. We will see you next week.